So, GDPR. Um, let's take it from the top. GDPR stands for General Data Protection Regulation. Um, and it is a new regulation from the EU. Since it's a regulation and not a directive, as we have in place today, uh, the current directive is from 1995, the regulation is meant to be law in all 28, 27 countries in the EU by May 25th, 2018. Since it's a regulation, it doesn't have to be implemented in each country, but since it's not a, to be honest, not a real regulation, it has some... Uh, we uh, mute somebody there, thank you. Uh, there are still more than 50 open uh, items, uh, 53 if you count detail, uh, more than 50 items that needs a national implementation national stance and uh, I'm going to show you the Danish stance on many of these topics today. But right off the bat, uh, please uh, be aware, we from Microsoft of course do not give, give legal advice. We can give you an overview of how we believe that the, especially the Microsoft Cloud Platform can help you accelerate your road to uh, GDPR compliance. So. Right uh, from the top of Microsoft, this guy, Satya Nadella, our uh, CEO, is setting the tone. And we believe this to be very important for every company to at least give people uh, the notion that GDPR and the handling of personal identifiable information, you'll hear me say this a lot, PII equals personal identifiable information. And this is what is regulated by the GDPR. And it's important that your CEOs, your management, right from the get-go understands that the GDPR, the, uh, the uh, responsibility for GDPR compliance actually lands with the board. So we need our management teams to understand what GDPR is and how we handle PII, because uh, this is going to be something that is going to be on many, many management teams, board meetings regularly. So we're happy that Satya sets the tone at Microsoft uh, and everybody from the ground up gets training in GDPR, not only to tell the story, but how we ourselves are going to live up to the GDPR accountability requirements. This guy, Brad Smith, is his name. He's our chief legal officer and uh, one of our presidents, so he reports only to Satya. Since he's the top lawyer at Microsoft, we believe it, uh, again, uh, lands on his desk to make sure that we, everybody in Microsoft, and that's um, somewhere around 120,000 people worldwide, that we understand that this actually touches on everyone. It's not just an EU thing. It's for every company that handles PII that is collected or processed in the EU. And I said, or processed. Because even though it might be a, let's say, an Australian company, uh, collecting data on South American individuals. If it happens in the EU as a service uh, delivered out of the EU, GDPR is still, or the, the, the service of the data collection still is has to adhere to the GDPR. So it's for everybody. It's not just for European companies. The uh, one hour that we've set aside for this uh, webinar is uh, really divided into five elements. I'm going to give you a, let's say, a crash course is in what is in GDPR. I saw there was a few of you who actually work with this in your company. Uh, I'm not going to touch on all the elements. It's more than 220 page, pages of regulation, so I'm only going to take out the highlights and address some of them. If you have specific topics you would like me to discuss or answer questions on, again, use the IM and we'll uh, make sure them at least at the end. Top right there. I am going to give you the perspective from the Danish legislators. We are currently processing a new data protection legislation in Denmark, and this gives a hint on how we at least interpret some of the open items in GDPR. And then, of course, how Microsoft as a company, both as a data controller, we are a data controller, just as many of you and your customers are. When we process data, for instance, in Skype or in LinkedIn or Outlook.com or Xbox Live, wherever we offer a service where people have to handle, have to, excuse me, have to hand over some of their PII, we are the data controller, just as 
we as just as our partners and our customers are. But we are primarily, and that's really what I'm going to talk about today, is we are primarily a data processor. The term data processor comes into play when we offer our cloud platform, where people host their solutions in our cloud platform, be it Office 365, CRM Online, Dynamics 365 in general, um, and all of our Azure services. Microsoft is the data processor. And of course, we have a bit of a responsibility there. The third bucket is then really to give you an overview of the cloud platform. What is a Microsoft cloud platform? Where are our data centers? How do we uh, make sure they are separated and how are they handled? What are our policies and what are our procedures to make sure that we handle cloud data or data in the cloud in the right way? Fourth level, and that's really where hopefully the meat of the, the matter is, how do we then suggest uh, that our customers and our partners prepare for GDPR? What's the process you, we would suggest that you walk through? And how do Microsoft services and products play into making sure that you're not only prepared, but you're absolutely, uh, actually also compliant by May 25th next year? So I'm going to end on a note of, look, there are definitely many services and products that can help you if you have such a desire, both from Microsoft and from many other vendors. But naturally, being from Microsoft, I'm going to list you uh, many of the services that we offer. In the end, quick summary, and then, of course, today is going to be time for Q&A. So let's get started here. What is GDPR overall? As I said, it's from the EU. The EU has two different sorts of legislations, like I said, the, a directive and a regulation. Directives has to be implemented by each country if they, they have two, uh, two, uh, two years to do it. Um, actually, it took Denmark five years the last time. 1995, we had a directive, and in 2000, we implemented it by law. We're quite slow or meticulous, some would probably call us here in Denmark. But when it's a regulation, we have two years until it becomes law in each country. And um, so the regulation was uh, agreed upon in the EU Parliament last year on May 24th, meaning on May 25th, 2018, the EU data protection regulation is going to be law in all EU countries and for all the companies that either collect or process services or data in the EU. Overall, there are four major purposes of the GDPR. There are more, many more sub-purposes, but the overall arcing purposes are the four you see on the right here. The focus is really on the individual, the personal privacy rights. So when I'm a customer of Facebook or when I'm a customer of Skype or whenever I hand over PII, I should have some rights to those data. As long as they are personal identifiable, it's my data my rights, and I should have rights I can invoke on whoever collects, controls, processes them. Those who process them then have increased duty to be able to protect them. And there's a major shift here that you have to do a risk-based assessment on what kind of protection you have to add to whatever PII data you collect and process. And it's a huge positive step forward that the, it's actually, it has to do with what kind of risks are my data subject to and what kind of mitigation would I then suggest that I take. This is a great positive step. We believe from Microsoft that this is a really a positive step towards gaining further trust in digital services, trust that whoever handles my data has to adhere to the same standards, the same processes, and make sure that my data are processed in a manner that still adheres to my rights. Also, of course, uh, two, let's say, uh, very strong tools has been put in GDPR that is a major shift for many. First and foremost, should a data breach occur, or you even just have a hint of a data breach that occurs, you then have mandatory breach reporting rights, uh, not rights, responsibility. So if any company who processes PII 
gets a whiff of uh, somebody might have accessed the data that shouldn't have, or data has been copied or breached in any other way, you have 72 hours to make sure that you notify all that are affected. And, of course, notify the authorities as well. This is a huge and very powerful tool that has put, been put in GDPR. We'll talk more on that in just a second. And then, of course, the fourth bullet there that everybody really focuses on, that there are now significant penalties. And I put a double uh, stars there just to make sure that people understand that this is the penalties has it's a framework. There is a frame, there's a maximum fine of 4% of your global annual turnover. For a company like Microsoft, that's quite a lot of money. But for most companies, 4% of your global annual turnover is something you should fear or you should respect. Uh, so, of course, this puts a bit of pressure and it puts a bit of attention. And this is actually the primary reason for GDPR being on the agenda of most boards around the world. But again, it's a frame. So it's not automatically that you get this huge fine for not living up to full compliance with GDPR. In my view, you or in our view, you definitely have to be pretty bad at your data processing and data protection and handling of, uh, of privacy rights to uh, incur such a fine. But it's great that the frame is there now, and it, of course, puts attention to data protection, which, again, we believe is a great thing. So, if we, we need, of course, to s remain calm, uh, let's not panic, let's not say, look, everybody is going to get a 4% fine or 20 billion euro fine for whatever data breach we get. This is, are the rare incidents. I uh, believe it's going to be a while before we see such an incident. But there are also other reasons to not panic. The GDPR has a ton of elements that we already know from the current directive. The stakeholders, the data subject, the person that uh, of, of, of whom the PII actually um, deals, the data subjects are the same. Data controller, he or she or the company who collects data for whatever purpose, that is the data controller. Doesn't change either. Data processor, if you leave it to somebody else to do the data processing, you have a third party data processor or you could process the data yourself as a data controller. Same, same, no difference. Data controller, Microsoft are data controllers. We are also data processors. Most companies are data controllers and data processors. And many companies also add third-party data processors if they use third parties, for instance, a cloud vendor or just a local hoster. Those would be data processors as well. So nothing new there. We still have the same types. When it comes to data types, it's more or less the same as well. We only have two classifications. It's either personal identifiable or it is special sensitive personal identifiable. It's pretty obvious here that, um, of course, some data are more sensitive than other. Your sexual orientation, your political affiliations, your religion, health data are special and more sensitive PI. Now, what's important to understand that this, this is nothing new. We've added biometric data to the sensitive. We've IP addresses to the PI. But what is, uh, what is not new is that you are absolutely allowed to handle both PI and sensitive PI. You can handle this. You can have it processed by a third party. There's no changes to this. The reason we have a sensitive PI category or, or uh, classification is simply that there are more rules, more regulation, more data protection needed. You need to have stronger measures to counter or mitigate the risks that sensitive PI is subject to. This is neither new, not new today either. Data transfers, again, not much new to say here. Uh, if there's one thing new is that we, we now get a uh, confirmed list of who are the safe third-party countries outside of the EU that we can use for data processing. But other than that, it's the same as it is today. It can happen. The data processing can take place anywhere within the EU or the uh, European Economic uh, Union. So 
Switzerland and Norway are part of that as well. But if you transfer data out of EU AWS, if you transfer data out of it, or you process data from outside the EU in the EU, you then need to add the adequate security controls and you need to have the legal framework in place, what we call EU standard contractual clauses. This is not new either. It's the same frameworks, both security-wise and legal-wise, if you want to do data processing outside of the EU. The only new thing is we're going to have a fixed list, probably nation by nation, um, explaining who are the safe third-party countries that we can do data processing in if we have the EU standard contractual clauses in place and the adequate security controls. Again, it's not new. The fourth pillar there is, uh, is about compliance. Uh, whenever I talk to the regulators, they always smile because they have, of course, realized, as has many of us, most customers are not really compliant today. We don't comply with a law that might not be um, uphold, upheld. Uh, at regular. So even though we say, of course, it's easy to be compliant if you comply today, well, that's true, but hardly anybody does because the penalties are uh, obviously uh, not there yet. Now, what, is, what does change? Because, of course, a lot of uh, things change with GDPR. I've tried to, uh, um, let's say, put them in four buckets. Now, about the personal privacy rights. Uh, there are a lot of talk about, for instance, the right to be forgotten, uh, the data portability right. Um, the right to insight and right to uh, correct your uh, any errors in your personal data. And those are all true. Yeah, these rights have been described. What we have to make sure is that people understand these rights are not necessarily absolute. Often these rights has to be justified. They have to be proportional, meaning they have put in safeguards to make sure that nobody can troll a company and suddenly have their operations put to a halt because they have 10,000 requests for uh, data insight being sent forward. But of course, it is an individual right. Most would, of course, what we do in Denmark, for instance, they are rights that you, of course, don't have when it comes to public sector data. I can't ask the tax authorities to forget about me and, and not... Uh, uh, know about me anymore. I can't ask the police force uh, my right to be forgotten. Would you please invoke it? It makes uh, absolute, uh, obviously sense that not all rights are absolute. But of course, in general, you have to keep your eye on these personal individual rights. If you process data for individuals, they are PII, they could have the right to ask you to delete all knowledge about them. They could also have the right to take back their consent, that you can use whatever data you agreed on, that uh, they don't agree on that anymore. You don't have their consent. And then, yes, you have to delete their data. It is absolutely in the hands of the individual how their personal data can be used from the outgo. Of course, there are limitations, as I described before. When it comes to uh, controls and notifications, the one that people mostly talk about is the 72-hour notification requirement. This is something that would definitely have been a pain point for many companies and public sector organizations, just say, the past five years in the EU. Numerous data breaches, more or less serious, but there's no doubt that individuals' PII has been breached, has been spilled or hacked or and if you as a, an organization had to notify each and every one of them of a potential breach, it's not only a loss of face, it's probably a loss of trust, and it could result in a loss of customers, hence revenue. So definitely this is something that people have their eyes uh, very firmly on. Now, I should say that many of these uh, rights and, uh, and requirements haven't been described in detail how to be implemented. We still have some open questions on that. In Denmark, the Department of Justice, the DOJ, have put out a list of guidance papers they will be releasing from September to January, 13 papers in total, notification, 
is a separate topic. That will be a guideline. I believe it's in November or December. We'll see a guideline on how are the 72-hour notification supposed to be implemented. As you see, uh, I mean, there are transparency policies, as, as I have listed there, and the, there's IT, and there's training, there's awareness. I'm not going to go into each and every one of these, but just notice that many of the uh, elements of uh, GDPR has absolutely nothing to do with IT. This is not a technology, neither problem or technology solution. Now, technology is definitely part of what we use for handling and processing data, and it's absolutely part of what we do to secure the handling and processing of data. But you cannot just uh, believe that you can get to compliance by implementing whatever IT system. You need processes, you need management, you need policies, and you need IT, and you need awareness as well. A huge part of this are organizational measures, it's training measures, making sure that your employees understand what PII is and how they are allowed and or not allowed to handle them. So, um, that was a crash course. Again, I will point you to some white papers. I, uh, I would suggest, actually, that you go to Bird & Bird, a law firm, and look at some of their, uh, they've written brilliant white papers, uh, very uh, easy to read, white papers in most languages on what is GDPR, and from them, the lawyers, you will get the full Monty, what is everything in GDPR. Um, I know the white papers are anywhere between 15 and 20 pages, so it's pretty easily read. I have focused in on what normally is or are the topics I get questions on from our customers. So, Denmark. I know many of you uh, don't reside in Denmark, but uh, that is the, uh, the scope of where I work. I could have included Iceland as well, but they're just going to be leaning up on, uh, on what, um, leaning on what Denmark uh, suggests on, uh, on legal matters. So, if um, you probably don't follow Danish legislation, hardly anybody do, unless you're a geek, uh, legal-wise. I do. May 26th, they published a 1,200-page document in four separate sections that uh, goes through all their thoughts on uh, GDPR, how they interpret uh, separate elements, and how they would suggest them implemented uh, in Danish law. Then finally, in June, they published the, the hearing material, so a, a full-fledged proposal for a new Danish data protection law, DPL, um, and they expect on 2nd Tuesday of October, when our parliament joins again, they will have a full final proposal uh, ready to be passed in uh, parliament. Now, the topic of data protection legislation is not anything that po uh, po politicians discuss very much. So it's really left up to, uh, to us and uh, the IT business or the business uh, world in general to uh, give input to this hearing material. And we have uh, a ton of material. Overall, Great proposal, uh, very nice that they actually try to simplify some of the legislations. Uh, but there are also a few outstandings that uh, I want to highlight here, some positive, some negative. On the right, you'll see what we call the, or I call the most noteworthy proposals in the law. They have decided that the Data Protection Officer, the DPO, that we are not going to have that many DPOs in Danish private companies. They suggest that it is a, an absolute minority, meaning it's less than 10% of all um, publicly owned companies that needs a DPO. This is much less than what was initially suggested, where there was uh, thoughts on uh, thousands of DPOs. If you're a public sector company, however, Everybody are expected to have, to have a DPO. What is still not really known is at what aggregated level you need a DPO. Could, should a single school, for instance, have a DPO if it's public? Or could we have all schools in a municipality have one DPO? Or could one municipality overall have a DPO? We don't know. But that is going to be in some of the guidance papers that we'll see later this uh, fall. Second, uh, and that's one of the downsides, First, of, uh, an upside, less DPOs, that's positive, less of a uh, cost 
for uh, privately owned companies. Now, a downside are that penalties for public sector organizations, they have left that to politicians. So if you read through the 22 pages of the legislation or proposed legislation, you'll see that the one paragraph where they were supposed to uh, figure out how to penalize public sector that doesn't adhere to uh, GDPR, they simply left that open. Uh, they leave it to politicians to uh, handle that. So we don't know, and we think this is a huge gap, and since most of the PII in a country is handled, at least in Denmark, it is normally processed, handled by public sector organizations. It's quite decisive that we figure out how to penalize, or at least incentivize public sector organizations to live up to the full GDPR. Third, is uh, it's a separate uh, Danish legislation. It's, it's what we call the executive order on public sector IT security. In Danish, it's called Sikkerhedsbekendtgørelsen. Don't try to pronounce that. Um, that has been retired altogether. It was a separate executive order, as it said, that it had to, uh, to put extra emphasis on how uh, public sector organizations handle their IT security. This has been retired. Uh, it's not that it's not uh, relevant anymore. It's just covered by the GDPR, so no need for double legislation. We, of course, applaud that. Beautiful thing that they... Uh, they handle it like that. Now the fourth bullet, 41-4, it's the old data protection law from uh, Microsoft, uh, from Denmark, <laughs> not from Microsoft, from Denmark. It was um, uh, it, commonly known as the war rule, and that is being retired as well. It was a, uh, let's say, rather nationalistic law, uh, or paragraph at least, that stated that uh, if a, a data set could be uh, of relevance to an, uh, an occupying force, you were not allowed to have it leave uh, this, the, the, the sovereign ground of Denmark. Now, uh, history, of course, has proven many times that geography is not a security control, so it doesn't really make sense to uh, put that kind of a requirement on specific data sets. They have instead uh, implemented what they call Article 3-9, Section 9, uh, and that states that it's by exception. And it really has to be a very special data set, something that is public sector and is important to national security. If that's the case, you can have a decision by exception that that data set has to stay within Denmark, the sovereign nation of Denmark. Again, we have to uh, counter that geography is not a security measure. Uh, we can uh, live with, and we think actually it's a good idea that you put extra security requirements on such data sets, but geography is just not a security control. It's, we've given this feedback, many people have given this feedback, so we believe that there is going to be a change in the law on that. So all in all, they seem to be living up to what is the purpose, simplify legislation, make sure that we handle uh, data in the best possible way, make sure that we have great oversight in DPOs and, and make sure, of course, that we still have room to maneuver, use data where it makes sense, and uh, protect data extra where that makes sense. There are similar processes uh, going on in, in, in every country uh, around Europe. And I would suggest that you get in touch with your local Microsoft office if you want to get a, uh, an overview of how we look at it in, for instance, the Netherlands or Spain or wherever. Now, again, I want to iterate, uh, iterate on, on this. Please, if anybody shows up at your doorstep and tells you, to look, just buy my product, buy my system, buy my IT solution, and you will be compliant with GDPR, you, you, you better show them the door. This is definitely false. You cannot buy a system, you cannot buy anything, any separate one thing that will make you compliant. In the end, each company has to prove that they are accountable for living up to all GDPR regulations that are relevant to them. Now, technology can, of course, assist you with this. It can make it easier for you to be compliant. It can make sure that you don't have leakage or you're not exposed to whatever security risk that a, another setup could be. And you should definitely put that in your 
tender or your request for information do you live up to does your system live up to can you adhere to the gdpr requirements can you assist us in living up to data portability or right to be forgotten do you what kind of encryption do you ensure that pii is uh, is handled with and such things but you cannot buy technology that will make you compliant now that said of course uh, i mean how should you look at GDPR? We believe that you have to look at GDPR as, of course, a. I mean, this is uh, this is something that's not going away. It's not anything you can ignore. If you do, you not only risk, of course, being penalized by the authorities, the regulators, but you absolutely risk losing people's trust. You risk that you, this is going to be a binary thing. Your customers are all going to be saying, "Look, do you live up to GDPR? Can you prove that you live up to GDPR?" And it, this is not a, you can't just say, well, yeah, we do 90%. 90% simply isn't good enough. You can tell them, yes, we are on the road to GDPR compliance, or we have a process that we believe will bring us to compliance by, by whatever date. But at some point, you have to say, yes, we are compliant. We will stay compliant. We have the processes. You can trust that our your data resides with us in a safe manner. And this goes both with IT then, you have to have IT, you have to have security controls in place, you have to have your data policies and transparency in policies, and you have to have the processes, the data governance, to make sure that you not only, only collect the data that you are proportionally uh, allowed to, you have the consent, this could be by contract or it could be an actual consent from your customer, or if you're a public sector, uh, player, this could be by law that you have to do collection of whatever data, but that you only collect the data that are required for you to offer the service that the data subjects ask you to. And then among data uh, governance are, of course, also to have great data hygiene. If you are not required to process the data anymore, if the service has terminated or a customer has left, you might not even have the right to hold that data anymore, to store that data. This means that you have to delete it, and you have to be able to prove that you deleted it. This is part of the whole accountability setup. Now, again, Microsoft do try to help both our partners and our customers get to compliance. We very early on stated very clearly that not only will Microsoft as a company where we process PII, meaning Skype, Outlook, LinkedIn, whatever. Uh, we will, of course, there be compliant. We will be able to live up to the full GDPR. Um, but also that we are committed to making our platform, our products, our services comply with GDPR. If you choose to run the services or the products on premise in your own data center, in your own environment, it's kind of out of our hands. We can make sure that there are tools and processes, functions, features in our tools for you to use, but it's really up to you to implement them. If, on the other hand, that you outsource some of it to, let's say, a CRM online solution, much of the GDPR compliance falls in the hands of Microsoft as a data controller. We will, of course, then supply you with uh, all the documentation that you need to stay compliant. I see questions popping by. I will wait. I see uh, time is flying, so I'll, I'll make it a little bit quicker so I get to the questions in the end. Um, I want to get concrete on what we do uh, towards our customers, our co cloud customers. We have already, because they, they are what you probably all know as a data processing agreement, a contract that has to be in place between a data controller and a data processor. Now, such a contract has been in place since very early on, we made our first cloud solutions back in 2007. But it, it's in place, it's been uh, incorporated into what we call our online services terms. And by Friday this week, on September 1st, you will see that our online services terms actually then include, by standard, the data processing agreement that is required by the GDPR. So also our contracts, way before it needs to, adhere to the GDPR. I put a link, a short link there, that will bring you to the uh, the latest uh, online services terms where you can read about the uh, GDPR. And again, as I said before, 
once you hand over much of your data processing to a Microsoft Cloud or you utilize the Microsoft Cloud through some of our CSP partners, you will then, of course, need documentation from us on how do we do this and that, how do we do physical security, how do we handle the fact that we, of course, have to hire people that run our data centers, or how do we do uh, hardware decommissioning, all the documentation for actually having that security set up and privacy handling. That documentation, of course, will be available. It is already, but it will be packaged and ready for you to use in your own documentation on how you become accountable. And furthermore, of course, we have to go back to this some, something that we've talked about all along. When it comes to compliance with international standards and regulations, we have and we continue to have and we are committed to, uh, furthermore, stay compliant with the widest portfolio of any international standard in any industry, in any nation uh, of any size in the world. So if you look at the FDI, PCI, SOC 1, SOC 2, um, HIPAA, any kind of certifi certification that we can, uh, we can adhere to in our data centers, we have, we maintain, we continue to be audited by a third party on it. So giving you a transparency into that we actually do what we say we do, and we have been certified in doing just that. So cloud, if you choose to use a cloud for Microsoft, it's of course nothing fluffy, it's not in the cloud as such, it's just a data center of, let's say, some size. This is just from one of our data centers, I believe it's in, in the US, Boise, Idaho, I think actually this is. It's just to give you a view of, well, these are just data centers, they are humongous, um, but they are part, of course, of a uh, global data center infrastructure. We currently have, um, it, it Week by week, this actually changes, or at least month by month, it changes. We have more than 130 physical data centers in the world. But what is more important is that we have divided this into what we call cloud regions. This is an important term in uh, when it comes to EU legislation. Now, you might remember that I said about processing of data, that anywhere in the EU, data can be processed under the same legislation regardless if it's in Portugal, if it's in Ireland, if it's in Denmark, or if it's in Germany. No difference to the legal framework. This is why Microsoft region, regions have been divided into, well, we have two regions in the EU, uh, soon four. No, actually, we have three regions now, soon five. We have the Northern Europe region, meaning the Irish uh, data center are the primary, secondary is then Amsterdam. If you choose the Western Europe, you will have primary Amsterdam and secondary Dublin, all within the EU. We are building in France, we are building in the UK. UK, of course, Brexit is going to be their own region, not part of the EU region, but we are building in France as well. Germany, I'll get back to you. Now, the, the thing here is that if you choose to put a solution in a data center solution with Microsoft, you choose where data at risk are. So which region does your data, uh, are your data stored? If you choose Northern Europe, you know, your primary copy is going to be in, a, in Ireland. That's the hot copy. Now your backup and your will be in Amsterdam, meaning you will have data at rest only in the EU, and data processing will ha happen within the EU. In some instances, of course, you will ask for maintenance, you will ask for support, you will ask for service on your turn. This could then, of course, require us to find the right skill in our infrastructure. This skill could be in um, Vancouver, Canada, or it could be in, uh, in, uh, in Australia or in the US. Now, that resource would then have to tee us into your tenant, meaning legally there would actually happen, a transfer of data would happen from the EU to whatever country this person would be sitting. No physical movement of data, but legally you do a data transfer. This is why we need the EU standard contractual clauses to make sure that we still adhere to the EU legislation if support is given from outside the EU. But again, data at rest only happens in the EU region. This is important. And then back to Germany. As you can see here on the slide, Germany are blue and the others are very dark blue. Some might notice that China has the same light blue, uh, which is because they are both what we call sovereign clouds. 
some customers, this is not based on any legal requirement, but some customers in the EU still express a need for a non-Microsoft handled Azure cloud or Office 365 cloud or CRM online cloud. So we have built our data centers in, the, in Germany. Same setup, same certification. They're just run by T-Systems, a German company under Deutsche Telekom. And they are then the data trustee. Again, the security setup is exactly the same. The legal setup is exactly the same. It's only handled by a German company. For some customers, this makes a difference policy-wise. Legally, no difference. Of course, these are being utilized and they're available for everybody within the EU. Um, the open market in the EU requires us to do that. And we happily do it, of course extra cost, 25% extra, give and take, uh, depending on the service that you use. But you can, of course, get access to having your data not only stored in the EU region, but only in the EU region in terms of support and maintenance as well, and with a German data trustee on top of that. This is unique. This is something that, uh, as far as we know, none of our competitors are able to, uh, um, to, to copy. Well, they might down the line, but right now they're not. So the uniqueness of the Microsoft Cloud Platform are really into these four buckets. I've talked at length about the regional storing of the data trustees, so I'm going to pass on that. But then on the security setup, privacy setup, please think about Microsoft have been running data centers, some of the glo largest global data centers since 1989. This is nothing new for us. We've done it for a while. We not only adhere to all the new standards, we help build them. We create new standards when it, in terms of security and privacy controls and setup. And we are, as it says on the bottom left, second to none when it comes to third-party certification and adherence to standards that gives you a transparency into how we do stuff um, and where your data is. And the final, the fourth bucket there about our approach to data protection and how we treat authorities that ask for data insight uh, when they have investigations, uh, account terrorism, uh, pedophilia, human trafficking, all that. Of course, there is a legal process for handling that kind of data uh, requests. Now, we are not always popular. Uh, among the uh, counterterrorism and, and police force, because we really do adhere to uh, this, the, the legislation in the country where data resides. This means that we'll say no. We've said no a ton of times. We've had many lawsuits, but we've won each and every one of them. We have a very strong principle approach to handling authority requests. Now, this isn't Danish, and I apologize for that, but I simply didn't want to um, translate the whole thing, because at the bottom here you'll see that there is a privacy policy, there's a link to that, and there's a personal privacy dashboard, meaning each individual can actually go into this dashboard and see what does Microsoft know about me? How can I then give consent or withdraw my consent? And when you log on from wherever country you are, you will get it in your own country, uh, in, in your own language, I'm sorry. So just to uh, make sure that you have those links. So how do people prepare for this? Um, I'm going to be quick on this because this is going to go into products, and this is not going to be a product uh, placement uh, webcast. But now we, of course, need people to understand that, that it, this doesn't have to be a huge test. You can do it pretty simple. You just need to get the overview. You need to uncover whatever risks that your data has, the data you process for your customers. So get an overview. Minimize the amount of PII you process. For that, those uh, PII you have left, make sure that you uncover all the risks and you then maybe not take action on each and every one, but at least do an assessment. Do I need to take action? Is this a scenario where there are special risks? Then, of course, I need to take action. I need to be able to then document how I do this. And this could be done both with IT, it could be done with processes and policies, and it could be done with organization. And if you need to run through this process, well, there are really four steps. Discover where you have the personal data. Figure out how you manage access and processing of this data. How do you handle user access control? How do you handle 
uh, rights management. Now we're down to protection. Do you put rights management on the sensitive data? Maybe it's a good idea, depending on how and where you process this data. Are there any low-hanging fruits that will give you extra protection, for instance, from past the hash attacks, where people steal your, your employees' IDs? Well, multi-factor authentication might be a low-hanging fruit for many of our customers. And then, of course, are you ready to do the documentation that means you can report on the accountability if regulators visit you? The most important error or the most important part of this uh, figure here, or illustration here, is the arrow going back from four to one, because this is a iterative process. We suggest that at least once a year you go through this whole process again, of course not with the same amount of detail. Many will, will have no new systems, no new data, no new processes, no new risks, but some will, and you at least need to be able to prove that you've gone through this whole process um, with a regular on a regular basis. If you want, there are of course solutions to help you. And from Microsoft, it's pretty obvious of course that each and every one of our products has its place in your preparation for either discovery, management, protection, or reporting. You see the separate domains or the separate scenarios that you need to handle on the left and on the right you see examples of what solutions would help you in the Microsoft Cloud and sometimes also in the Microsoft on-premise world that will help you get to uh, compliance in that specific topic of the four. This is not, again, it's not going to be a product demonstration. If you have needs for each and every one of these, get in contact with me. I will make sure you get the right links, you get the right information. But just rest assured that there are many tools out there that will help you that will assist you in getting to compliance. It will, again, not make you compliant, but the great tools to make sure that you, on Office 365, advanced threat protection. An obvious thing that we, we know that each company has at least one person who will click on anything. We all have this, and there's nothing wrong with that. Well, it'd be great if we could make sure we didn't, but everybody has one. So how do we protect our sensitive data from a customer who, or I'm sorry, from an employee who would click at anything and suddenly expose us to whatever hacking tool or uh, a, a spam uh, site. Well, most of these uh, incidents happen because people click on links or attachments they shouldn't have. Of course, we can then teach them, we can train them, don't do this, make sure you know who they're from, blah, blah, blah. And even though we train them one day, they get to work, they've had a bad day, they're low on energy, they don't really think, ah, uh, it looks like a video, I'll click on it, and boom, you have whatever WannaCrypt or other things in the environment. If you use Office 365 Advanced Threat Protection, you can do pre-screening, you can do safe linking and safe attachment, meaning you detonate all links and attachments before they hit the inbox of the user. So you scan them before the user sees them, meaning you can have as many employees who click on anything as long as you've done the pre-screening. This is a low-key, low-hanging fruit. And again, in each of these four areas, there are definitely um, solutions. If you want to know which of these are very uh, low-hanging fruits for you, for your setup, we've done a benchmark test that you yourself can run. 26 questions, it is superficial. 26 questions is nothing. It'll take you five, 10 minutes to answer them. It will give you then a, a, an assessment, a benchmark against other people in your industry, how they are prepared. And again, then end up in saying, look, maybe you should look at uh, Enterprise Mobility Suite, Enterprise, Enterprise Mobility and Security. Maybe you should just look at device management or whatever solution would uh, match your requirements. So, quick tool to run through, and in summary, make sure that you understand that a cloud is not just a cloud. A cloud could be handled, it could be set up in many different ways. You should absolutely look at the principle, uh, principles that a cloud is run by. Do they understand what security by design and privacy by design is? How does their compliancy portfolio look? Do they have all the international standards certifications? Do you have access to the a uh, statement of applicability for each of these certifications, and so on and so forth. In general, are there transparency into how they do stuff? 
make sure that you understand the cloud, the right cloud, a right cloud solution can actually be part of your getting to compliance. If you want more information, there are some links here, some white papers, uh, and also I do give a webinar where I update, this is going to be in Danish, I apologize, but it's going to be in Danish where I once a quarter update on the, the legal side of uh, GDPR. Um, and again, link to the online assessment. Now, if you want to get in touch with me, you can ask uh, QBS, of course, but uh, now I think I have five, ten minutes to look at all the questions, if there are any. There are three. I'll, um, let's see here. UK need to comply to, to the GDPR, so 28 countries. Absolutely, you're right, Andy. Thank you. Um, and I'm pretty sure that even though Brexit happens, the UK will uh, adhere to, uh, to GDPR. And GD, oh, I'm sorry, UK companies that collect data or, or process data um, f from the EU would, as any other country in the world, have to adhere to GDPR. So you're absolutely right. Uh, what I don't know is how the GDPR is going to be implemented by law in, uh, in the UK. I don't know about, for instance, penalizing public sector organizations in the UK, as I don't know about it in Austria and other EU countries. Um, so it was not to suggest that the UK stands uh, out of uh, GDPR. Um, there's a question here from Mark saying, does GDPR affect pr uh, prospecting when telemarketing or direct mail in terms of opt-in marketing? Great question. Uh, first and foremost, if this includes personal identifiable information, absolutely. The scenario or the domain or whatever doesn't give you any leeway at all. If it's PII, even just names or email addresses, it is PII and it is subject to GDPR. Now, you say opt-in. That's a good term because the GDPR actually stipulates that opt-in is the norm. Meaning, and I know most EU countries have had stuff like this, but for the US, this is new. They normally have opt out, meaning you have to tell people if they can't use your data. GDPR states, if I hand over my data to a data controller, that data controller cannot have this as a default. I have to knowingly give the authority, give the consent that they can collect the data they collect because they want to give me or offer me a service XYZ. If they later on decide, look, we can actually do not just XYZ, but we can also do B, they have to get a new consent. So the consent has to be specific. It has to be proportional, meaning they can't tell me, look, you can't have our service at all unless you give us all your data. That is not legal. You cannot sign off your rights. It has to be specific and it has to be proportional. It has to be by, uh, not by default, but it has to be uh, by action. So opt in, absolutely. I hope that answers your question, Mark. Uh, and then Andy has a, another question here. Uh, will there be some sort of GDPR compliant logo and reference list of companies that pass the requirements? Very good question again. There is in GDPR um, a, an article describing that the regulators in each country and hopefully also in the EU would be able to create a list of codex that you have to adhere to if you want to have sort of a GDPR compliant uh, statement. Now it's it's only it's very rough right now. We don't know what it's going to be uh, be about. It might be national. It might not even be EU wide. But uh, it's something that everybody's looking for. We really want to have a brand, but uh, there is no such thing. They've laid work, the rough work that something could uh, appear, but we haven't seen anything. This is thing that is actually a big change. If you today, with the directive and the national laws, most EU countries have a law in place right now that states if you as a data controller hand over data processing to a third party, for instance, you use a local hoster or you use a cloud vendor, that's a third party data processor, or even if you hire a consultancy firm 
to do whatever an upgrade or a specific product uh, project for six months. They also handle PII as a data processor. When you do that, you need uh, to have a data processing agreement. Now, many of you don't have that as it is now, but uh, that will definitely be a requirement. Um, another thing you have to today is when you do that, when you have a third party processing your data, you then have to report to the authorities, we're doing this, company X is doing this for me, I'm company Y. And this is the data processing agreement. You have to report that to the authorities and the authorities then assess or do nothing for years. That has been the case. Uh, but at least you have to report it. With GDPR, this is no longer the case. You simply don't have to report back, but you have to be able to, at any point, if the regulators pay you a visit, you have to prove that you are accountable, that you know that you have your data in this and this place, and this is our data processor, and this is the data processing agreement, this is how we do this and that, these are the processes, this is the policies that we have in place. You need to be able to prove accountability regardless of when the processor, the regulator, I'm sorry, the regulator pays you a visit. This is new, um, but uh, should make it more smooth because you don't have to report in and get it an approval first. You can actually just go ahead and use whatever data process you need as long as you know they are compliant. Final small caveat to that, they are highly regulated industries and the most noteworthy are the financial services industry, FSI, which is under separate legislation. Uh, they continue to have the, uh, the, they are required to actually report to their authorities, the financial services regulators, that they do third party processing. For, so for separate industries, there are separate regulations, but financial services are the, uh, the, the one large exception that you should make sure. Um, another question from Tommy, what about external partners that do data processing but in our own systems? This is actually the same thing, you just have to make sure that when you invite uh, external partners in and use your system, if they have access, even theoretically, if they have access to personal identifiable information but they're not, your uh, not employed by your company, they're employed by a different company that has a contract with you, the contract you have with this third-party contract uh, uh, company has to have a data processing agreement in it. It doesn't have to be anything. It, this could be two pages. It's, it's just there's a very easy-to-use template that simply stipulates what are the requirements of this company that you've hired to do data processing for a specific project or a specific time period. So it doesn't have to be anything big. You just have to make sure that you can actually prove that you have a contract and within that contract is a data processing agreement, so you know they are liable, they are uh, supposed to live up to, and they have to prove that they are accountable to GDPR as well. Okay, um, you're welcome to everybody who posed questions. Thank you so much, uh, great questions. I hope this has been worth your while. I don't dare put another poll. Uh, on the slide here, but please do give your uh, your feedback to Danielle, um, and thank you again to QBS for setting this whole thing up. I appreciate you spending an hour, now an hour and five minutes with us. Um, again, thank you so much.